Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Hone and Izzy Lawrence. On this week's episode, a brand new dinosaur that was only discovered this century. Plus, Danny Raviotti on whether dinosaurs fart. You say Scantosauriopterygids, and I say Scantosauriopterygids, yes. I mean, we all grew up knowing what Scantosauriopterygids are, so I really think that this one might be (laughs) boring for people who, you know, obviously had the T-shirts and the toys growing up. Uh, So, um, yeah, Dave, why did you pick this topic? Because they're a really cool little group as a whole, and they encompass quite a lot of interesting, very recent history. Hang on, hang on, hang on. You just said very recent history. Are you talking about the history of paleontology here? Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about about the history of paleontology. I mean, this... I was going to say, are, are they some sort of like Robin or something? No, I mean, this, this is a 21st century dinosaur group. So I think the first one was named in 2002-ish. And OK, Ooh. yes, you know, we're always still discovering new groups, but we don't often find, you know, relatively unique, established and clearly distinctive ones. And I think collectively they count as that. And then they've also got some interesting history that tie together some odd bits of uh, kind of the process of science and taxonomy. So, Scansoriopterygids, in case by some chance there's someone who doesn't know what they are, are a group of um, very small feathered dinosaurs um, that are theropods. They're very close to the origin of birds. Um, but sit just outside of that classic triumvirate that we keep talking about of birds, dronosaurs, and truodontids. They're mostly tiny, so 30 centimetres or so at adult, though with pretty short tails, though that's something we'll talk more about in a bit. They're mostly known from juveniles. So far, they're all just known from the usual high-quality fossil beds of north to east and China, kind of where you'd expect to find stuff like this, uh, because several are preserved with really, really nice feathers on them and they're now widely regarded as being probably a weird early branch of the oviraptorosaurs so oviraptor and its near relatives uh, for a while they bounced around as various different bits of derived feathered feathered dinosaurs there was lots of i don't know what it is um not helped by the first couple of specimens being very fragmentary and one of them being very juvenile so didn't have a lot of data to go on so like, obviously a theropod obviously pretty close to birds with all those feathers after that were kind of running out though personally i remember a conversation with legendary paleontologist xu xing in china who was my postdoctoral research supervisor jonah shuan yeah who's american but now based in south africa and i remember both of them around 2005 ish saying they thought these were over aptorosaurs so that got mm. called very early without having the data to kind of back it up So when are we talking? Are we talking Cretaceous, Jurassic? What are we talking about? So there's definitely stuff from the middle Jurassic. So this is this this is something that gets that I I think Uh, yeah, this is something I think people have still not quite quite seeped into popular understanding. There's these vast series of beds in northeastern China, Liaoning province. It was quite a long time until we realized that there are two distinctive sets of beds there, one of which is the very end of the middle Jurassic, possibly the earliest late Jurassic, and one of which is early Cretaceous. And before that had been worked out, everything was assumed to be the early part of the late Cretaceous. And it's only more recently that we a whole bunch of things have been pulled out. So a classic example being this lovely little pterosaur called j Opterus. J J J E J E H O Yay Hole Yay Hole Opterus we now okay. know is not from the Yay Hole biota <laughs> because that's the Cretaceous one and it's one of the tri- <laughs> it's, it's one of the Jurassic ones. Well, we need to etch a sketch all because, these names. We really know, but, do. but the point the point being that everything got assumed to be lumped together and then he only later realised that there's two things actually quite disparate from each other. And I'm now suddenly realising I'm not sure if any of these actually come from the Cretaceous bit. Really? They're all Jurassic? So hang on, because I remember you saying that birds' origins are about mid-Jurassic as well. Yeah, for, for the same reason that we have we have dromaeosaurs and truodontids and a bunch of those other things in these same late middle Jurassic beds. Um, and so if okay. all of these groups have appeared, then the birds must be around as well so these are small and they're feathered are they flying ah 
And that's where it starts to get interesting. Right. <laughs> to tell that story, the easiest thing, I think, is to go to the start and deal with the horrible initial taxonomic mess. Because as we just complained about names, one problem is, so normally with, with groups, the name of the first thing in that group takes the name of the group. So Tyrannosaurus was the first recognised Tyrannosaur, and the whole Tyrannosaur clade is named after Tyrannosaurus. We have the Scansoriopterigids, but there's no Scansoriopteryx. Oh. Yes. And this is where things get confusing. So, in 2002, a paper came out from a uh, American paleontologist, is perhaps a slightly generous word, someone who's certainly very interested and engaged in paleontology, called Stephen Serkis, uh, spelt C-Z-E-R-K-A-S. Um, and dinosaur enthusiasts were already well aware of Circus. Uh, because he was a, he'd started off in special effects. Um, he was one of the people behind, I think it's called Planet of Dinosaurs, which is the amazing late 80s, last great stop motion dinosaur film before Jurassic Park came along and, and kind of spoiled it for everyone, which is a horribly cheap B movie with actors who can't act and Doctor Who wobbly sets and laser guns, which are very obviously a washing up liquid bottle spray painted silver and Sounds awesome. gorgeously animated dinosaurs. They look brilliant and they're animated really well. They're still a bit tail draggy, but for the mid 80s, they're fantastic. And Circus was, I think, the lead animator of that, if I remember correctly. I don't know much about him. I don't know how he got into dinosaurs. He was doing other stuff. He published a paper on Diplodocus spines. So we would see Diplodocus with little ridge of spikes running down its back like an iguana. Circus was responsible for writing some of that up. So he was definitely engaged in paleontology and fossils and even publishing papers. He had this mini museum uh, with his wife and a bunch of specimens and had got hold of... And I think it's fair to say through probable questionable legal means, given the era we're talking about, a new little feathered dinosaur from China. And actually a, a, a really cool little pterosaur as well. And produce this paper. It's, it's, the, it's the classic, you know something's a little bit fishy when it's a new journal and it's edited by his wife. <laughs> and he wrote every single paper in the first issue of this new journal, which never had a second issue. And every paper of which was from a specimen in their new museum. It's not a great look. You know, taking vertebrate fossils out of China was and is not particularly appropriate. Um, there are ways of doing it legally and correctly. This was something that was definitely challenged on. And he named this thing Scansoriopteryx. At an almost identical time, like within days, another paper came out from a group in China naming a different specimen and calling it Epidendrosaurus. Due to the, at the time, unclear rules about, so I think we talked before about what's called the principle of priority. Whoever names something first, that's the name. But this had been created before the digital age. So we had this weird situation where the Epidendrosaurus paper appeared online, but was not physically printed. Mm. Then the Scansoriopteryx paper came out printed. Then the Epidendrosaurus paper got printed. And so there was actually a lot of, for a while, faff over Chicken and which egg. of these was the correct name, given the ambiguity in the rules. There's a paleontologist called Jerry Harris who wrote a really cool little paper about this. And this is one that I give my own students to read in my old taxonomy class to show the problems of these kinds of taxonomic conundrums. And it wasn't helped by the, as I say, questionable provenance of one of these specimens. Ultimately, Epidendrosaurus won that battle. It was deemed that Epidendrosaurus, by being online, counted and got the name. That group had only named the species, whereas Caesarchus and his co-author had also erected a new clade, which was the Scansoriopterigids. So you now have a group called the Scansoriopterigids that doesn't have Scansoriopteryx in it. It's a mess, Dave. It's a mess. It, it is. The other thing to say is this is still a small private museum with a questionable specimen in it that no one else has seen outside of Caesarchus and his wife and his wife well, and, and a couple of Chinese collaborators. It's not been like eliminated from the scientific literature, but people don't tend to cite it because it's an unverifiable, unaccessible specimen with some questionable history behind it. So we'll dump that to one side and we'll start with Epidendrosaurus. Epidendrosaurus is 
truly tiny. It's, God, I'm, I'm holding my hands up, like 20 centimetres long tops from nose to tail. It's still bigger than a sparrow. Yeah, most of which is tail. In fact, in, in, oh. my, in my analysis of paper of dinosaur tail lengths, uh, Epidendrosaurus has either the longest or the second longest known tail proportionally for, it, for its body. Um, so it's a very, very, very long tail made of loads and loads and loads of little vertebrae. It's a young juvenile. So it's it's really not a very it's not mature at all. So it's it's missing kind of lots of details that you'd expect. It's also one of the worst liaoning fossils I've ever seen. It's it's basically just an imprint in the rock. You know, normally these things are flat. Mm. This is like the hollow where the bones used to be, and you you've got to like hold it up to the light just right and turn it at an angle, and then suddenly you can see all these details. But like if you just stare at it in front of you, there's there's like nothing to see. It's like a bit of rock. It's like people with white tattoos why yeah yeah it's it's so it's it's like oh it's so it's it's horrible and so you look at it and go wow really cool little derived small theropod and, and i'm out like there's, there's nothing else to say about this damn thing and then a few years later along comes epidexipteryx now epidexipteryx is quite a bit bigger um <laughs> it does sound like i mean if i was ill with a cold i'd have a spoonful of epidexipteryx and feel a lot better. <laughs> I was trying to take a drink in the break and I nearly lost it. That's brilliant. Um, so we've got Epidendrosaurus, tiny but juvenile, very long tail. Epidexipteryx, probably an adult or close to adult, 30 centimetres or so. Quite, quite sizable. Still obviously a very small dinosaur, but but proper. Now, it's, it's got bones and everything. It's like a proper, proper bone fossil with stuff. First notable thing, barely any tail at all. One of the shortest tails of any dinosaur I've found that's complete. So you've got two animals, which at the time are the only two members of this clade, one with the longest ever tail and one with the shortest ever tail. Hence why I tend to moan when people try and guesstimate total length, including the tail. It's like, you know, it's like lions and bobcats. They're really quite close relatives, but yeah, tail, tail lengths cause issues. What it does have, though, is spectacularly long feathers, four of them on sticking out of its tail. They're really long and they're flat and they appear to be basically solid. They're not like a feather in terms of lots of little fluffy bits that then collect to each other and, you know, you can zip no them up flute. like Zilpro and you stroke them. No, it's it's just like a plate. They're really weird. This is still relatively early days of feather evolution. It, it looks like a weird experiment. So it's got these four big kind of, we'll call them signal feathers on the tail. Is it constructed like a feather? Um, I think just, you know, if a very, probably something like a, I'm thinking, I think you're thinking of a ruler, you know, okay. your, your standard 30 centimetre shatterproof. But, but how is that feather? I mean, how is that not just like a massive like shard or a scale or something? What is well, it? B- well, is because it... it's, what well, because it the rest of the animal is covered in feathers. We've, we've got the floof on them at this point. We've got the floof on them. That's the important. And they don't appear to have scales. Remember, scales are really pretty solid, tough things. Mm-hmm. If feathers are preserving, you'd probably expect scales to preserve, and they're they're not there. So, I mean, I'm just trying to think of this thing. How do you identify it as a feather if it's nothing like a feather? That's what I'm trying well, to Well, because work out. it's almost certainly made of the same material okay. and being produced in the same way, given that that animal is otherwise covered in feathers. So it's a bit like looking at... A- humans have got hair on their heads and also hair coming out of their fingers like fingernails. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess it's probably a bit more like a fingernail in that regard, but you can see that it's thin and it's, you know, it's. I think it's reasonable to call it a display-like structure. You know, there's an infinite number of birds, including fossil birds with big plumes on the tail. It's probably something like that, but I, I definitely take your point. It's, it's small, but it's much closer to being adult. It's given that, you know, as I say, it's 30 centimetres with barely any tail at all. It's much bigger than Epide- Epidendrosaurus. It's definitely feathered. It's a proper feathered animal because we've got the feathers. We've got these weird long tail plumes. It's got kind of almost squirrel-like incisors at the front. So it's kind of got slightly jutting forward. Oh, lovely. Flattish teeth. Um, The one thing which is really frustrating about it is it's preserved at a really odd angle. So normally when you get all of these um, flattened fossils from these exceptional preservation, you get them in one of two positions. They're either kind of flattened perfectly on their side, as if you're looking at them in silhouette running sideways. Um, so you, Tyrannus, we've talked about and, and things like that. I mean, it's, how, um, it's how you die. It's a thing where you wake yeah. up in the morning with a bad neck because you've been sort of like... Yeah, yeah. But, they, they, you know, they, they all look like hieroglyphics. You know, everyone's yeah. perfectly side on with their head in perfect profile. You know, so they're either like that 
or they're flat on their back with their arms open like you get with Archaeopteryx. Like my cat it's, on the sofa. Indeed. It is almost inevitably one of those two. Guess who isn't like that? Uh, Epidextrix is at this weird kind of quasi angle where it's it's like you're looking half under its chin and then its head's smushed into a weird shape because it's flattened. I should say it's very blunt headed. Okay. It, it doesn't have any kind of real snout to it. More like naked mole rat then with its teeth. Yeah, or, or almost, yeah, in, in that they jump forward. But also like the head shape is almost like human or, or uh, something like a baboon. You know, there's a bit of snout there, but actually baboon's probably even a bit, chimpanzee would be better. You know, there's a, there's a bit of muzzle, that's a better word, below the eyes, but it's not got the, you know, the theropod long It's not got the tyrannosaur, you... big, nice, joined up nose yeah, the, bone. The, the, or... Yeah, Alice, yeah it, it is in some ways probably Probably more like an over, early oviraptorosaur, uh, and the early ones of them have teeth. So that's and including some teeth that stick out. So that that's a link which it's, I think some people were, were looking the, at early on. This thing with like, so imagining if you if you got one, you could get its back tail and go exactly, and then it's got a head a bit like it's the size of the squirrel with a head a bit like a squirrel, no beak, even though it's feathered. Like, you, do you know what I mean? It's it's like yeah. a. It seems wrong. Are you yes. sure? Are you sure? Have you looked? Are you sure? Yes, yes, <laughs> I, I am. I am sure. And and this is it. And so we have these two oddities where one's a tiny juvenile where you can barely see any details. The other's much better preserved, but it's at this weird angle. So it's actually hard to compare, you know, when all the other bones look either X or, you know, they're either in this view or that view, and this is in neither of them. It's like, well, how do you compare it properly? Um, so, yeah, so we're, we're stuck with these two animals in this group that look kind of mismatched with the tails, if nothing else, um, going, well, weird small feathered dinosaur from a time when there were lots of weird small feathered dinosaurs. Who really knows what? I mean, they're probably not that close to birds. They're not showing any of the really birdy characteristics. They're clearly not true or dromaeosaurs, so they're not that close. Um, and it's not that people like forgot about them. It just was only so much you could do. And so I think they were, at least mentally, people kind of filed them away as this taxonomic oddity. As I said, at least a few people thought they were probably a weird early over at Torosaur. That now looks like it's probably correct. Um, but that's kind of the end of it. Maybe they were climbers. So I should go back. Scan Scansori. That means Scanser is something that climbs. Uh, Opteryx, so winged animals. So they're the kind of climbing winged animals, even though they didn't really have wings at this point. So you think it was supposed to evoke the idea that they're feathered. You know, that that wing suffix is kind of there to, to mean you know, they're the climbing little winged things. They have got very grippy little hands. One of the things that has come up, so Scansori Opteryx has got a couple of really long fingers and various people have gone, ooh, just like eye eyes. Oh, so yeah, the, yeah. the nocturnal lemur which also has the gnawing teeth, a bit like Epidexitrix. And, uh, uh, you know, are they gnawing in the game? Um, I very much suspect not because everyone mischaracterizes the fingers of eye eyes. Ha ha. So oh, oh, there's, a, there's a kind of bit of reverse myth busting in that it's not about the dinosaur, it's about the uh, analogy. So you will see it said that uh, eye eyes have an extremely elongated fourth finger. And they actually don't. What they have is an extremely narrow fourth finger. It's the same length as the middle finger. It is just a fraction of the diameter. Now, that's useful because it means they can dig it into these little holes, but it's not actually super long. Epidexipteryx, sorry, Epidendrosaurus, it's probably the, all having the same bloody name. Uh, Epidendrosaurus has a really long fourth finger and several people, I don't think ever in the literature, but on, online have gone, oh, just like eye eyes. And it's like, no, because eye eyes don't actually have that. Um, but the, the long fingers have certainly been inferred to suggest that they are climbers. So we've got these two weird animals that's about, that are feathered, fairly close to birds. That's about anything anyone's really prepared to say about them. And then E turns up. E? Uh, e, Y, I, all known almost universally as E, G. So like Tyrannosaurus rex, this is one of the very few dinosaurs which is name, named by both names because it's E, Y, I, K, Q, I. So it's got four e letters in its name, including the genus and species. I mean, I hate to um, belittle it, but it does sound like a Pokemon. And it sounds like a good it, Pokemon, though. It, it, it does a bit. So, it's, so E, G turned up. Um, e, G is... Not actually really any better preserved than Epidexipteryx. It's yet another spatch-copped, flattened thing with some fluff on it. 
and a bunch of bits. But, and and this is the incredible but for anyone who doesn't know this, it has what at first glance appears to be a third arm bone, which is more than a bit odd. That's not possible. Well, te- tetrapods, I should say, because we're not including fish here. Tetrapods, so animals with limbs, university have a humerus, your, your upper arm bone, then have the radius and ulna, which is the pair of lower arm bones, then you have your bunch of wrist bits, and then you're into the hand. This has got a very clear humerus and a very clear radius and ulna and some wrist bits, and then another big, flat, long bone that's about the same size as the radius and ulna. Um, and you're like, well, that don't look right. Um, and it sure as hell don't look right. You can't just grow a new bone out of nothing. So it's something else. So what is it? What is it, Dave? Stop doing this to me. Tell me now. For, first of all, you can just grow a new bone out what? of nothing because things <laughs> things do. Um, so we talked about pterosaurs. They have the pteroid, so the little bone that supports the front flap of wing. Well, we kind of have one. We have kneecaps. Lots of animals oh, yeah. don't. But one thing that lots of animals often do is heavily modify their wrist. I've literally just mentioned the pteroid in, in pterosaurs. It's a very heavily set modified wrist elements with an apparently new one. There's the famous panda's thumb. So pandas somewhat appear to have six fingers, but they don't. What they actually have is a giant extra wrist bone with a little bit of flexibility on it, which gives them some grip. There's another group that have a weird, giant, long, flat wrist bone that at first glance could be mistaken for the bones of the lower arm. Flying squirrels. And not just any flying squirrels. This has evolved multiple times in different lineages of flying squirrels. Including Volaticotherium. Uh, that isn't a flying squirrel, and I don't think it has one, unfortunately. But it was a great opportunity to... I tried. I, tr- I remembered the um, name of something, Dave. But this this is called a stylopodium, and it is basically, very specifically, and it has a bunch of hallmark characteristics in all these different gliding Stylus. mammals that we see in E.G., which is it is there to support a membrane wing when flying. <sighs> So it is a bat. Well, it's got feathers because Ichi does preserve feathers. Why doesn't it use feathers? And it also appears to have a membranous wing running off the just giant wrist bone and down into the body. That's just it appears greedy. to be flying off a combination of feathers and wing membranes. People have called it like bat dragon and bat dinosaur and you hate over exotic over exotic and simplified name, but it's not effectively, you know, the even though we had Epidexipteryx and we had Epidendrosaurus, E means we have this new lineage of first of all uh, going up into the trees again if they're gliders, and then have developed a entirely independent form of flight, which incredibly, as you say, doesn't use the feathers, the one thing that everyone knows that feathers are good at. No, they they went for membranes, which is not a big surprise because almost everything that can glide goes for membranes. So it does explain, because it would be using these long hands and figures to climb, and then it's not too far from that when you get a bit of webbing to be able to flap down a bit, and then you can, you can and, see and how And quite possibly work. there's sub-membranes between the fingers to give it a bit more control and steering and stuff like this. Does the four-tail ruler thing help, or is that just for looking... It could, it could at this point help towards counterbalance and steering it could well just be a display feature i mean like i said there's so many birds living and extinct have big tail plumes to, to show I mean, off. presumably they're less weight than an actual tail yeah that could factor into it oh, but it's a weird creature did it breathe fire not that we're aware <laughs> and these are all tiny though these are not there's no bigger ones yeah um but- Ichi is similar size to uh, Epidexipteryx, so, you know, 30 centimetres snout to tail with this admittedly very short tail. So, yeah, you know, big, big crow kind of size, but that's really at the, you know, bottom end of dinosaur sizes. Um, They're really quite tiny in the grand scheme of things. E, at least, is probably close to adult. And then we have the last one, which came in, I think, only 2017, so now only four years old, uh, Ambopteryx. Anopteryx. And bop. And bop trips, as in like, almost like the Hanson dinosaur of Mbop, but it's Ambop. Ambop. Nice. 
Dot, dot, do, wop. Yes. I've just got that in my head. Do it up, I do. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yes. Yeah. I'm Bop Tricks. Do it up, I Bop Tricks. Be, 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 if, if you'd like to keep it in your head, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so we've we've now got Ambopteryx. Ambopteryx has basically the same features of as E. It's, it's a new species, but it's it's got that same thing, and that's kind of where we are with them. Uh, like I say, it, for, we've gone from two thousand and one they didn't exist to two thousand and two we instantly had two, and then another one a couple of years later, and now we're up to four or brackets five question mark with Scansoriopteryx itself. We've got apparently this in, independent group of gliders. I should say to be very clear we do not have a wing membrane preserved on these animals it is purely inferred but it is an incredibly reasonable inference from that bone which is so similar to what we see in flying squirrels and some other lineages they've all independently acquired it and all independently acquired it for exact same reason it's really pretty good um i don't think anyone seriously thinks that it's just a misidentified other bone or it's turned up randomly or it's not doing something like cool they're gonna look bird like and bat like and yeah, slightly lizardy as well because well and slightly squirrely as you said they, they've got these little short faces with these slightly procumbent forward pointing teeth uh with the fairly big incisors but they, they won't have squirrely eyes they'd have bird like eyes wouldn't they because they'd be dinosaur eyes so well be... or reptile eyes yeah yeah it's um and what were they eating do we think I think, you know, Epidexitrix probably got by far the best skull. And as I say, it's kind of smashed at a funny angle, unfortunately. But then if if you remember, because we think we cover this in Overaptorosaurs, they're actually a group whose diet is pretty uncertain itself. Um, so the early Overaptorosaurs, we've definitely got some herbivores. It includes ones with gastroliths, so the stomach stones. So they're probably herbivores. Some of the big ones, like Overaptor itself, Cagnathus and stuff like this, some people think they're predatory. Some people think they're omnivorous. There's a, at least a couple of people have suggested they're herbivores and then eating things like fruit and seeds and nuts and cracking them open with these beaks. So their relatives actually don't tell you very much because we've got probable herbivores, probable carnivores and probable omnivores in their ancestry. But it doesn't suggest they were hunting insects if they've got big incisors. I mean, that's more like the sort of, if you look at birds and that sort of thing. But in that regard, the I.I. thing may not be a bad analogy. Maybe they are chewing into trees to get at insect grubs and stuff, just not doing the whole finger thing because I think people have over-egged that side of it. But that's the, th- that's the thing with those kinds of teeth is that it, it's good for biting something that's really quite hard and tough. And that could be a nut or a, you know, a fruit kernel, or it could be to chew the bark off trees. I'm trying to remember if it's tamarinds or marmosets, but it doesn't really matter. One of the very small little monkeys that you get in South America, one of those two groups, and it annoys me now, I can't remember which, some of them live almost exclusively off tree sap. They just nibble holes in the bark, and when it oozes, they, they lap at that. I mean... So you want big chewy teeth for that. And you're kind of effectively a herbivore at this point. But of course, what they're mostly eating is just sugar. It's almost like <laughs> you're feeding on flowers. Who knows? And I'm not trying to overly speculate, but it's it's really hard to pin down. And I think you could make a case for them eating nuts and fruit or eating larvae or doing stuff like this and chewing off bark and eating stuff like that or getting stuff out of the tree or a combination of all of these... I tell you what it's not, but it could be, but it's not, is it could have been really cold and they could have been adaptations for swimming that we can't work out yet. And it, they could be using their teeth to dig holes in the ice. It took me a second to see where that was going. Thank you very much. <laughs> that, that's, that's the kind of hypothesis that I get emailed occasionally with. And it's doing this through some mechanism that we haven't worked out yet. Yeah. If, if, if that's part of the logical progression of your hypothesis, it's probably not worth emailing it to me. <laughs> I still think that's why you need the feathers is to keep warm. Mm. And, Boy, uh, you're underwater. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Shut up. Well, penguins do it. <laughs> penguins have, yes, I know. They do. <laughs> That that's a really bizarre looking. It, it reminds me most of a church's gargoyles. Yeah, I mean, not terrible as an analogy. Yeah, you've you've got 
and, and they are this, this kind of odd melange of this kind of squirrely, lemury head with batty wings and then feathers. And it's, you know, usually micro tail, which is a very birdy thing that the other dinosaurs don't usually have. But with massive tail feathers, not like bird tail feathers, but like really hard, slappy things. Yeah, yeah. it's Like nail yeah. files coming at your butt. They're really quite cool. And I think E got a lot of attention, and quite rightly so, but I think people really skimmed over the fact that, as I say, they, they have a very recent history in terms of the research and quite a convoluted one with issues of preservation, alleged smuggling, access to specimens, publication dates, taxonomy, and it's... Bleh. Has anybody looked at how big these things could have gotten? Because obviously I know their relation to um, Overaptor and stuff, but presumably mm. they're not, they're like a cousin of rather than a direct ancestor to. Yeah, we, we always talk about yeah, re- relatives of rather than direct ancestors. Exactly. They'd, they'd be a, they'd, I mean, they'd be a pretty early branch if they're branching off in the middle Jurassic because that's when the Overaptorosaurs themselves have branched off from the main lineage. Cool. So I, I'm trying to work out how big they could have got because obviously we've only got these small samples of them could we work out how big the largest flying one is just by working out the type of wing it's got compared to a pterosaur or something else that's similar i guess in theory but you're really hampered because if we don't know the exact extent of the membrane that's going to have such a massive effect on the wing area and therefore lift and what it can carry you know if the extra thing you know if the fingers are involved or whether they're not if that if that membrane reaches the hip or the ankle it changes the size dramatically maybe they had something between their legs which a lot of flying things like democtrons have all of this is unknown and then of course we don't know because the feathers are mostly missing we've only really got feathers on epidexipteryx and they're mostly fluffy you know does it have good flight feathers on the fingers does it have no flight feathers at all so i guess you could try and work it out but with that many unknowns so i could do my phd on that is what you're saying this is what i could do is the thing i could you could spend a lot of time basically guessing a number i mean there aren't many really big gliders like demoptrons i've just mentioned so they're, they're often mistakenly called flying lemurs or more correctly called kalugos because they're not lemurs um they're from southeast asia i think they get up to like two two and a half kilos and then mums will fly around with fairly heavy babies on them so you're talking about kind of three kilos in the air which for a glider is massive absolutely massive most gliders are a fraction of that yeah i don't think there's anything in the there's a couple of fossil things in the fossil record which are similar kind of size gliders and probably about that kind of weight but i can't think of anything that gets much bigger than that and are we sure these are gliders and not flyers like a bat because bats fly that's a bit of a tangent to this episode and i'd want to read up on it before we really talk about it but it's been argued more than once that a whole bunch of these things close to birds were potentially powered flyers there's definitely been an argument that archaeopteryx is not like the font of all birds well at some level we know it isn't because it's late jurassic in fact it's quite late in the late jurassic rather than these middle jurassic things when they birds must have been around um but there's an argument that archaeopteryx isn't even on the bird lineage and is actually somewhere buried in the dromaeosaur truodontid thing he talks a bit about this with um simon Watt. yeah that's right so if if, if archaeopteryx is definitely a powered flyer and it is not a bird then either you've got very early flight origin and then it's lost multiple times or it's evolved more than once and that has also been argued for a bunch of these other things and off the top of my head i don't know if that's been argued for e and ambopteryx so i don't know but that is absolutely potentially a thing i want them to be flappy i want them to be creatures of the night and potentially to breathe fire and, and suck your blood suck your blood i know because they've got the big they've got the big nori teeth that would be stupid oh actually yeah vampire but bats that, that, do that's have, what you yeah. want so th- this is if we're getting into correcting animal nerdery yes there was this um let's say grossly mistaken idea that jay haloptrus the little pterosaur i mentioned earlier was a vampire because it allegedly had these giant canine like teeth a, it definitely doesn't, and B, that's what movie vampires with Christopher Lee in them and Tom Cruise in them have. We want Nosferatu teeth. That's what we want. But yeah, but Nosferatu has vampire teeth. Vampires have these nasty, really sharp little V-shaped incisors right at the front of their mouths. They don't have weird big fangs halfway down the side. 
That's absolutely not what they do at all. Um, so yes, uh, and, uh, Epidexipteryx is rather closer to a vampire in that regard because it's got big sticky out incisors. So maybe it was using its um, arms not to climb trees, but to climb sauropod necks. And, and, and I, I, I personally want to hear the sound of it drumming its tail and go clack, oh, yeah. clack, clack. <laughs> I, I, I had a ruler earlier and I'm not at a desk. It would be perfect time to, to do that and add the sound effect, but I can't see it now. I've got a wooden one. Hey, I'll find mine. We can do it in sync. <laughs> oh, I've got it. That ruler's been flapping around my desk for months and now one time I actually want to put my hand on it. That is the nature of rulers. That was yeah. that sounded a bit like a fart, anyway. which would be useful considering who got coming up. <laughs> Hang on. Good. Right. So um, I made a fart noise with a, a ruler. We have a fart expert coming on the show. Do you want to introduce her, Dave? Um, so, yes, this week we've got Danny Rabiotti. Who is, um, I know from her, her Twitteriness and lots of science outreach engagement Twittery stuff um, with her work on hunting dogs, which is how I first saw her. And then she ended up doing the incredible book, Does It Fart? Which I think everyone in the world has now read, though, apart, apparently apart from Izzy. So hopefully uh, many of our science enthusiast guests will know her from one of those two places. I am appalled that I haven't read your fart book because that sounds right up my street and I will be getting it for various friends of mind i'm sure for birthdays and christmas because and that's quite a good euphemism too yes do you even like dinosaurs or are you more of an uh, extant um, animal lover yes in my day non-fart job i'm a scientist who who works on on mammals particularly so i'm probably not really supposed to have a soft spot for dinosaurs but no i do i do really really like dinosaurs um yeah ever since i was a kid going to the they used to have this big animatronic t-rex in the birmingham museum and i used to love it Uh, do you have a question that you would like to ask dave about dinosaurs yeah so i do have a question so when i was writing does it fart i had to come up with whether dinosaurs farted or not and i I did actually find a paper on this about sauropods in particular um and it said they probably did fart they were probably super gassy but i'm interested to know like how do people who like dinosaurs work this sort of thing out how do we go from oh we've got these bones to this dinosaur farted or burped or what it ate or (laughs) yeah i mean a, a, a combination somewhat inevitably of really Really pretty hard science and I think often well beyond what a lot of people expect you can do with fossils and a lot of interpretation and inevitably a soupçon of guesswork or filling the gaps in and hoping you're not too wrong with with some of your data um uh, and one one big problem we run into with things like digestion and physiology and stuff like that is of course we don't have 50 ton reptile herbivores around now so we can look at big elephants and rhinos and giraffe but they're still a fraction of that size but they're the biggest herbivores that we've got and they're mammals and they're probably quite different And we look at big reptile herbivores like tortoises and iguanas, which even with the giant tortoises are not particularly big. And then, of course, most of these animals don't eat Mesozoic plants anyway. They've got a whole bunch of Mesozoic plants still around with us. They're not really eating the same kind of things. So you've got a model organism as a mammal, which is quite terrible for a dinosaur, and a model organism of a tortoise, which is quite terrible for a dinosaur, and neither of them are eating the right stuff. So you can see where there are some gaps in our knowledge, but I think, you know, probably similar to some of the stuff you do in terms of, you know, extrapolating behaviours or or making inferences, you look at pretty much all the available data. And if you see that pretty much all big herbivores, no matter how big they are, sooner or later seem to produce some methane, it's probably pretty reasonable that most dinosaurs on average are producing some methane. And also, wasn't it like sauropods in particular, they're so massive, partly because they have these enormous digestive tracts. And that's a whole part of the reason they are so big is so they can keep food in them for as long as possible so they've got to be parping like crazy surely well I, i'm not sure because it depends how efficient their digestion is and what byproducts are coming out at what process and all the rest of it so they could have been big burpers this is where we're getting well beyond my knowledge unfortunately so d- d- we'll ask dave a question that i can't <laughs> that i don't know the answer to. Oh, turns out he doesn't know either yeah I, i'm not a <laughs> digestive physiologist for giant herbivores <laughs> 
But I, I think certainly you, you know, things like cows are extremely methanogenic because of the way they digest stuff. But things like elephants and rhinos, despite being much bigger, aren't. Elephants in particular are kind of fast throughput animals. So in other words, <laughs> they just eat stuff. Their digestive st system strips off like the easiestly digestible nutrients and throws the rest out. Whereas cows eat it and process it and process it and process it and process it and get every last morsel out of it. That's what I think the dinosaurs are doing. But I suspect they're doing, I don't, well, I, lots of people think that, but I think they're doing it even better than a cow could. Again, because a 50 ton animal has a digestive system where they can keep stuff in there for days without having to go through lots of sub chambered stomachs. But I'm not entirely sure what the implications for methane are. Interestingly, most methane from cows is, is burps, not farts. So ah. that's, it's hard to tell what end it's going to come out. Um, and you've got to be careful where you light your cigarette in that case. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be gobsmacked if most big dinosaurs that were herbivores were not producing methane because they're just going to have methanogenic bacteria in them. But then the question is, are they cow-like and producing huge volumes or are they actually keeping it right down? I can't imagine anything with that long neck neck being it wanting to chew cud and i presume the reason that cows produce the methane out of their mouths is because they're moving it from stomach to stomach and part of that is bringing it back up to chew yeah that'd be a challenge yeah definitely that's that's why cows produce so much methane because of the, the cud chewing it's all ruminants so anything with the four chambered stomach um but i don't know how you know i don't know how there's so many questions with dinosaurs like i don't know how often you find what the digestive system structure looks like so no not not very We've got a couple. We do have a few with stomach content where there's just like stuff in a patch and you can see where it went. For some of the small herbivores that didn't have teeth, they were swallowing gastrolith. They had stomach stones. Oh, and yeah. now I guess sleep too, but in a different cool. way to things like chickens and ducks. And we file we find, you know, a little pile of stones in about the position that you'd expect to find the stomach. So it, it's pretty much there. Um the one where we've got a really good one is a little thing called Scipionix from Italy. Um and I'm now trying to remember if we've covered Scipionix before. And I don't no, think we have. I have not heard of Scipionix. I'd have remembered Scipionix because it sounds like an Asterix character. <laughs> it very much does. Uh, Scipionix is like one of the best preserved dinosaurs full stop ever. It's a tiny little thing, like 60, 70 centimetres long. Um, it's not quite complete. It's clearly a young juvenile. Um, it's a small carnivore. And what appeared to happen to Scipionix is it died in some kind of muddy, or got washed into some kind of muddy river or something. And all that mud and stuff got washed into it. So presumably the floundering around as drowning or dead with its mouth open and that fills some of the digestive system so when it then decayed away although the actual digestive system is gone you've got basically an impression of it and you can pretty much see here's a bulge of the stomach and here's some wiggly bits of intestine that's bad luck for the dinosaur but great luck for us <laughs> but an absolutely incredible find yeah and it, and it does have stomach contents and it's got like fish and insects and several other different bits in there which is kind of what you'd expect for a, you know, what is really quite a tiny carnivore, you know, baby crocodiles, it's exactly what they do. They hoover up pretty much any small animal that they come across. Um, but that's one where you can see most of the digestive system, at least its layout and orientation. But I, yeah, we don't have one for a big sauropod, unfortunately. Damn. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's what you, I mean, this is, as, as you kind of going back to your original question, you know, this is the big hole or the, you know, the the, the <laughs> elephant in the room or the, the, saur, the sauropod that isn't is that, you know, we are the vast majority of time just working from bones and even when we're not and we have things like Scipionics it's one specimen and you don't know you know there are very, lots of very close relatives of cows that don't have four chambered stomachs so even if you found a cow with that how confident would you be that bison had that or that camels had that or giraffes had that or deer and the answer is well you probably shouldn't be because lots of those don't there's a surprising amount of soft tissue elements to consider when you're trying to work out if an animal farts so as I as I found out when I was reading the book this like digestion structure whether they have a tight sphincter or not whales don't do don't do a lot of farting because they don't have a tight enough sphincter well they don't even poo do they whales don't poo they just sound like they're trying to <laughs> it explains why they're so big i'll go away 
<laughs> with Wales, it's just that it's just that kind of cloud, isn't it, that comes out the back? Yeah. I, I can't believe I'm asking this. So when you say the sphincter isn't tight enough, do you mean gas can't build up? It just kind of leaks out? Yeah, it just leaks out slowly, <laughs> slowly leaking out. So they're always farting. They couldn't be polite. Is yeah, that still not basically. a fart or does it not count because it's not controlled then? We did count it, yeah. Any gas coming out the rear end, we were like, that's that's a fart. Okay. So if an animal didn't have a head, then it couldn't. Uh, so dinosaurs were definite candidates. I had so, to do a lot so of So things like that. starfish can't officially fart because they've only got no. one, okay. one hole. Yeah. Because then you can't tell. Is it a burp? Is it a fart? Is it a fart? Yeah. yeah. Or, 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 an, or you need a new word to cover. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, dinosaurs weren't the least. They weren't the least amount of information I could find, which was... What, what, what was the what, least? Yeah. Spiders and bats were just an absolute mystery. We couldn't find out whether they did or not. Spiders, I just love the idea of someone sitting there with a microphone and a gastronometer <laughs> on the back of a web going, not yet. <laughs> But the interesting thing is that birds don't <laughs> fart. So where in the dinosaur lineage did the farts die out? That's the question for for all paleontologists. To yeah. Answer. Well, I mean, I mean, they're, I mean, they're ans- they're ancestrally carnivorous. So that you know, the earliest birds are carnivores and are from a line- a long lineage of carnivores. Um. So you'd think they're probably lacking that mechanism. But yeah, it's 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 a surprise that it doesn't build. Up. But again, is that a sphincter issue? Because you've got the cloaca kind of doing everything. Um. I think it's basically they lack a lot of the bacteria that would be gas producing in the in the digestive system and also because food passes so quickly through birds so that they can fly um, yeah but they haven't tested every single bird so it, there might be some like particularly chunky ground based birds that might penguins look for the bubbles yeah I'm thinking of uh, hoatzin because they're they're the big folivores and obviously yep. leaf eating and leaf digesting is the kind of thing that should be doing that for you although sloths don't fart so just throw in another spanner in the works there <laughs> what so these are extremely unhelpful organisms <laughs> but, but ex- exactly that point is that you know for some things we have real confidence when you're making those extrapolations if you say no you know if we've tested you know hundreds of birds at least and none of them as far as we know do that suggests that the origin of birds is that feature is absent and then you're kind of stuck with well where the hell does it come from because you know in a completely gray area of maybe maybe not for almost everything i think it nicely illustrates you know what what you were saying earlier about dinosaurs right it depends on what organism you're modeling it on and then if you just choose one like a different animal with a similar diet it doesn't it doesn't give you the answers to those questions it seems seemingly random until you know quite a lot about that animal yeah and i, I think that's i think people overlook that and think we know a lot more than we do i'm i'm often i, I find people are really amazed when they'll ask a question and go well you know did dinosaurs do this or or whatever you know even for modern animals go, we haven't got we haven't got a clue no one's looked at i'm shocked that we don't know if spiders fart i'm shocked yeah <laughs> but, it's, but you, you don't know, hear I... them do you you never hear a from the corner and they go, oh there's a spider <laughs> Uh, I said if we sold a million copies of our book, I'd set we'd set up a fart lab and answer the question once and for all. Do and, and, spiders and, fart? And how short are you? Because I know you've sold a lot. Oh, a, lo- a long way off a million. Uh, okay. <laughs> get there. We'll get there. But yeah, I know I, I've had my like first year undergraduates ask what they think are very basic questions about all kinds of different organisms and systems, and I go like, no one knows. <laughs> there, there is, you know, yes, you know, hard biological science has been a field for a couple of hundred years at a push but no we have not catalogued the biology of every single organism in great depth and even if we had i have not read every paper on every single organism you're a disappointment dave you're a disappointment yeah. con- constantly and to many people isn't that our job yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, Oops, was it someone said that you know, the, jo- the job of a science communicator is to disappoint people. <laughs> I, I have a joke in my set about historians, which goes: King Arthur, if he existed, probably stood here. If he had legs, we just don't know. And that is that every single director and documentary maker is like, please, just give me a fact. <laughs> yes, for, for fictional things. Yes, it becomes rather difficult. <laughs> I, I, if you've got time, could we ask you a little bit about pack hunting and that sort of thing? Yeah. We're covering a little bit about um, pack hunting in trianosaurs, which we, we don't I, I, I basic, uh, The short version is lots of people have said they do. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they did, but the actual evidence is... Slim on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, yeah, well, it, it, it comes down to a bunch of groups found together in the fossil record. And it's like, right, but that's not the same as pack hunting. You no, know, me, 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 I me have a cat... lot to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> me, 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 me cats are highly social, but are not pack hunters. So you would be surprised how many animals are cooperative hunters that are not necessarily what we would think of as pack hunters. You know, when we talk about pack hunters, it's like they're all work. They all have they you see you see it on the telly about African wild dogs. You see like they have their own roles and they all define their roles. But when we actually started putting um, loggers onto these animals and like actually measuring their hunting, um, number one, mostly they don't live in open habitats. So the really long chases where it's like, oh, Jeff, say, yeah. the wild dog yeah. does does th- this bit of the chasing and Gary bites mm. the wildebeest and, you know, Lucy bites it on the bum and that's their jobs. That's kind of how it's pitched when you see it on the telly. But actually, when we measured it, they were just all hairbrained running through the undergrowth, <laughs> um, like chasing Go, squirrel, one squirrel. after the other. <laughs> Literally like that. <laughs> they do hunt as a pack. They flush the prey out of the undergrowth. But once one runs out, they just all just one at a time run after them. It's not... It's, it is pack hunting. They are not clever girls. Yeah, it's it's the, the yeah the lack of planning and coordination. Yeah, and yeah. assigned roles. It's not. It doesn't work that way. It's, yeah, it's more. You know, they share. They do share the food when they bring it down, and they do tell each other. Well, tell each other, not like, "Oi, mate, the food I caught some. Yeah. I'm over here." But they do call to each other so that they all can get some. But yeah. they don't like. It's not super coordinated or organized. It's a bit more. Like if you were beating pheasants from the undergrowth and then yeah. you shoot one of them, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just whatever comes out. Yeah. Yes. I'm really not surprised at all to hear that, but it's really nice to have it confirmed. Everyone always says about African wild dogs, oh, they've got the highest, they've got the highest hunting success rate of any predator. But then they always give this figure that's like 90% hunting success rate, 95% hunting success rate. And and that is true for one animal, one prey type, they have that success rate. And that's baby gazelles. Oh, so yeah, the ones that can't run very fast and there's 20 dogs going after them. Yeah, yeah. I always say if I ran through the plains <laughs> with my mouth open, I would probably catch a baby gazelle, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not it's not necessarily the challenge that it's being made out. No, but they do have a much higher hunting success rate than lions, which is what matters really. Uh, for yeah, anyone um, studying African carnivores, as long as yeah, you're above I've, the lions. Yeah, I've, I've got it down as something like 60%. So I, I give a, because we used to do the field course in South Africa, as you know, because you helped Rob out cover that lecture. Yeah. Um, golf, um, so I, I give the one basically introducing all the animals because I'm the general biologist who goes. And I do, and I have some stuff. And yeah, I had a I had a figure pulled out of a paper, and, but this is off the top of my head because I haven't got my notes open, of something like 60%, which was still remarkably high when, yeah, lions and hyenas are trucking along at like 15 to 20. It is, it is high. It is around 60% depending on the prey type, but it's not as high as a lot of the reports say it is and yeah. it's not quite as it's pitched in the media sometimes <laughs> so what makes what 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 do we consider a pack hunting animal then and what makes what's that different to say we gave the example um of a load of came and lying in a river and just all having their mouths open but all shoulder to shoulder so they could get the fish you know they're not hunting together but they're using each other to hunt what's the you know, it's a semantic difference but what is it that makes something we're working as a team here versus we're all going after something and one of us will get it and we'll share the result so i think it's interesting because the term pack itself is only used for a few species usually mo- mostly canids so i think a broader term would probably be group hunting and that would probably apply to more species but then i think from my perspective although there's people would probably have a different definition of this it's if that animal is group living and that group hunts like works together to hunt then that's what i would say is like pack hunting or group hunting um whereas if they live as a group and then go off individually completely individually to hunt um for example hyenas will often go off and hunt individually but they do sometimes hunt together as well that's what i specifically mentioned is yeah everyone thinks that spotted hyena travel in the big clan and he's like no actually that does 
happen, but like 70, 80% of it, it's solo. And yeah. then of course, because of all the screaming and whooping, the others turn up, but it's, it's not, it's not coordinated or organized or, or, or done in any systematic way. Even like your hunting dog example, you know, they, they've just got in random direction. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Whereas the, the dogs won't go off on their own to hunt. They, they kind of only really hunt as a group. Yeah. Even if they're going everywhere, they're, they're somewhat in a similar vicinity. But, yeah. They're, they're all facing one way and kind of go and then hope yeah. a bit. Whereas, yeah, hyenas will just disperse. Yeah, they'll go kilometres and kilometres on their own. Yeah. I've only ever seen a hyena on its own. Never seen more than one in the same place. <laughs> I I have, but only when only when they're either at a kill or when they are with pups. Yeah. So yeah, I've I've never seen a group of hyenas. Oh, I'd love to see a group of hyenas at a kill, but I've I only ever see one. There's only ever one there. <laughs> The, I, I didn't see the kill, but I saw it seconds afterwards. Was a spotted hyena, and yeah, it was all on its own. And and, and we we watched it for like half an hour, and nothing else showed up, let alone any hyenas. Was it whooping though, or was it a selfish hyena? No, it was hiding in the grass and devouring everything. <laughs> <laughs> it, it had a it had a decent sized impala and it was going so, through all of it. An evil hyena that doesn't celebrate and share its kill. That's not a good pack animal. No, and this is part of the issue with this interpretation of this is is as group like a. There's no evidence that they were even hunting in groups at all. Uh, and even if they did occasionally, as we see with the caiman example, you then got the flip side of well, you've, okay, you've got a group all eating something together, but that doesn't mean that they worked together to bring it down. And another really good example of that is vultures where they will come yeah. in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds but they're not all like they don't hang out together all the time they're just all attracted to the same kill so yeah but if you found those fossilized you might be like oh these are group living animals but they're they're not really <laughs> We've only got a short bit of time left. So favourite thing that everybody needs to know about wild dogs, please go. Uh, my favourite thing that I think everyone needs to know about African wild dogs is that they are super, super good at working together. So much so that they leave a babysitter behind when they go hunting and they have pups at the den. Does that alternate or is it a set animal? It alternates. So they all share the responsibility and Excellent. then they bring them food back when they go hunting. Oh, that's pretty cool. And throw that's... it up, presumably. That's the yeah, animal. yeah. It's yeah. the wonder of nature. It's so beautiful. <laughs> I don't think I know any babysitter who'd accept that as payment, to be fair. <laughs> Uber Eats, yeah. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very disappointed, Dave, um, that Danny didn't say that they had plans. Because I imagine dogs, African dogs hunting in packs, they, they, it's a bit like, you know, those rooms in World War II where you have the big map and you have the wrens pushing all of the boats around. Oh. <laughs> I, I wondered where this was going with you know how in World War Two, and I'm like I'm not sure where this hunting dog analogy is going at this point. This is no, no. This is the, this is the level of planning yeah. that I want. I want to in order to be like together in a hunt. I want everybody involved with their own role and their own. I'm very disappointed that this didn't happen. Yes, they were, they were little numbered planquins they can push around. But I'm not um, disappointed with with Scandisauropterids. 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 <laughs> Scandi, no. Scan- Scan- they're from Sweden. They're called Scandi. Scan. Sorry. Opterids. Opterids. Good. This is why I'm very happy that somebody um, called it Ichi. Ichi is a good name. E- yeah, e- he's a bit easier. He is a bit easier to remember. Them epidectrix, epidectrix, and epidendrosaurus. Epidectrix. Yeah, I Jeez. know. I know. This is this is worse than learning Russian, Dave. <laughs> I think you know it really is. It's going to be difficult, but I will learn them all. I will. I will know all the names of all the dinosaurs. I won't. It's just awful. <laughs> all right then. Until next week, we. We shall say rawr, rawr. thank you for listening to the terrible lizards podcast especially if you're a patron without you we wouldn't have made this series to be the first to hear bonus episodes and get extended interviews please consider donating at patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards you can find us on twitter facebook and youtube so you don't miss out on live broadcasts all the links are available in the show notes or go to terriblelizards.co.uk If you can't afford to support us financially, please do share this episode with your friends and leave us a review on your podcast app. 
do say hello via social media or drop us an email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com we love hearing from you and we love to answer your dinosaur questions 